Welcome to the episode of The Q, a show dedicated to hope, inspiration, and giving back to the community. Tonight in the studio, we have Attleboro Enterprises. We have Jerry Pinkleton, uh, CEO and President. Thank you so much, Jerry, for joining us. And later this evening, we will have John Reposer as well. So again, thank you so much. Oh, please. It's great to be here. Thank you. It's always good to see you. Oh, it's always good to see you, too. Um, I thought what we would start off with is the history of Attleboro Enterprises um, and the history of, of uh, children and families with developmental disabilities and how the change occurred. Sure. Um, actually, the history of AEI is embedded in that. Um, if you think back, uh, well, you're not as old as I am, but... Uh, Back in the uh, 1950s, 1940s, 1950s, up until that time, uh, if you happen to be the mother of a Down syndrome child, your uh, doctor, your neighbors, your minister, your parish priest would have told you that the best thing you could do for that child is to hand them over to the state and mm. have them live in an institution. And the state of Massachusetts built up institutions. There were seven, eight institutions throughout uh, the most local for us uh, was the Dever Developmental Center, which is located in Taunton. And these facilities literally were like cities. They had their own hospitals, own police departments, fire departments, their own farms. But uh, up to 2,000, 3,000 individuals with intellectual disabilities live there. Uh, by themselves. By themselves, okay. with, with state staff. With <clears throat> state but staff. without their family. Without their families. Yes, in fact, okay. many of them never saw their families no. again in their lives. How sad. In the 1950s, uh, there were families, uh, some very brave families, who started to resist that trend. And uh, they started forming groups in towns and cities. Uh, in Attleboro, it was led by Leon O'Brien and Fred Prue and um, a number of other families. And they, they uh, developed their own associations. And back in the 50s, they were called the Association for Retarded Children, which is now known as the ARC, A-R-C. Right. And uh, being politically correct, we don't refer to the word retarded anymore because right. it has such negative connotations. So they, those families uh, decided they were going to keep their children at home. But there were no services in town for them. Mm -hmm. So as, as a group, they started advocating for services for their children. And the very first organization in the city of Attleboro to help them out was the Attleboro YMCA. Really? It was. And it was <clears throat> Bill Bungard, who is the executive director. And he allowed those families to bring their children to the Y. That's awesome. And use the pool for two hours a week. Wow. Two different days. And that's how, that was the very first uh, organized activity that they had. Uh, as more, obviously, as more families uh, uh, were having children with cognitive disabilities uh, born in their families, they started joining up with the group. The ARC grew larger. They were advocating for education for their, for their uh, children in the school systems and the like. Mm -hmm. uh, and as they grew older in the 1960s now, when they were of 16, 17, 18, when I had my first job, actually, when I worked at, I grew up in Connecticut. At 14, I was working in tobacco farms in Suffield, Connecticut. Uh, uh, one of our life experiences when you're a teenager is getting that summer job or getting a part-time job. Well, these families wanted uh, that kind of experience for their, ch their children. So a sheltered work, what's called sheltered workshop started mm -hmm. being created. <clears throat> and uh, a sheltered workshop is a program where... Uh, is that the piecemeal thing where they would it do it per part or something? Some minimum wage. Okay. It's called yep. piece rate. Piece rate. Piece okay. rate. Under the Department of Labor laws, mm -hmm. you could pay an individual uh, sub-minimum wage. Uh, they would make uh, X amount of pennies yep. for every piece that they would complete. Uh, in Attleboro, the uh, Auga Corporation and uh, uh, I'm trying to think, tech, uh, Texas Instruments mm -hmm. were very supportive of the workshop, which was run by the ARC. Uh, then as time went on, there was a famous uh, uh, anti, uh, 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 oh, you're, you're the attorney, it's the one of a group of people file suit against the 
Anti-discrimination. Uh, anti, not anti-discrimination, but class action class suit is action. what I'm saying. Okay. You. <laughs> sorry. I didn't know where you were going. <laughs> no, sorry. But there was a class action suit against the state of Massachusetts in the early 70s. Uh, the which, was, which was big back then. Very big. Very big, yes. Very big. The reason the class, the class action suit was taken against the state of Massachusetts because the conditions in the facilities, those institutions, were deplorable. Yeah. Absolutely deplorable. Mm -hmm. uh, a federal judge, Judge decided that Massachusetts could no longer handle, could no longer run the facilities uh, in a way that would meet the needs of the individuals there. So the federal government under Judge Toro took over running the state institutions. And at the same time, the judge said, you families, if you want your son or daughter to leave these institutions, we're going to force the state to create those services they receive in the institution in the community. And that's the beginning of what we call the community movement. Mm -hmm. uh, Attleboro Enterprises is one of those. So the state of Massachusetts, under federal, under the judge, started purchasing day programs, sheltered workshops, started purchasing, purchasing residential programs where there would be group homes and individuals would live in the homes in communities near their parents. So uh, they're getting closer, but they're still they're not home. Close, not, <laughs> not, not quite home not yet. Not home yet. Not home yet. But uh, so the workshop, Attleboro Enterprises, was now uh, contracting with the Department of Mental Retardation and it was now contracting with the Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission, which serves a slightly different population. And as those contracts grew, the business of the workshop became bigger and bigger. And at the time, the Attleboro Arc, thinking that their primary role was advocacy for individuals with intellectual disabilities, decided that they would separate the workshop from the Arc. So half the board of the Arc took over Attleboro Enterprises and ran it as a business because uh, that was the fear of the people who were really into advocacy right. that the, running the business was going to be too much for the ARC. So that's how Attleboro Enterprises got started. That occurred in 1978. Uh, we moved into the facility we're in now in North Attleboro in 1982. Mm -hmm. And that's at 284 John Deesh Boulevard in North Attleboro. That's correct. And the phone number for Attleboro Enterprise, I like to get this out early. Sure, it's 508-695-4046. Yep. Okay, all right, yep. great. Um, and, so, and so we're up to the 70s. 70s. Late 70s. That's correct. <clears throat> okay. We get into the 80s. We're still running a sheltered workshop. Uh, then we get into residential services for the first time in our organization, running group homes, quite honestly, throughout mm -hmm. s locations throughout southeast Massachusetts, primarily New Bedford and Fall River, of all things. Really? Oh, yeah, because um, we were late to, we're late to the go in Attleboro. Uh, Attleboro had uh, Beta Community Services, was actually one of the first residential programs in the entire state. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Started by Larry Tuminoff, and uh, who's now a bigwig with DDS in Central Boston at uh, Central Office. Uh, so we got into residential services. In the '90s, we started getting into medical services for individuals, running a, a federally funded uh, day habilitation program. Programs that keep individuals out of the hospital, out of nursing homes. Uh, in providing them with uh, developmental skills training. You know, it's funny you say that because very often I'll, I'll be in court and, and I hear these I hear these Rogers hearings. I hear these uh, oh, oh, and it, it's so scary yeah. to think that you know there, there's someone advocating. Sometimes the person's there, sometimes they're not, and so what a huge movement, if you will. Oh yes. Um, starting way back to the workshops That's or right. before the workshops, but sure. but essentially the workshops onward yep. in an effort to reunite families. That's right. I, I think is what yeah. you're saying. It, it, that's exactly right. It was a big movement. Families being able to keep the family unit together, mm -hmm. even though it might be a challenge for the family. Right. It might be, a, uh, you know, Paul uh, Turgeon uh, recently won what we call the Ernie Augett Award. And... Um, 
because of the Augit Foundation, Mr. Augit was very generous to our mm -hmm. organization. We wanted to honor him with a, a, an award we give out every year in his name to the individual in our program who has made the most strides uh, against difficulties. And Paul Turgeon was the, uh, Turgeon was the first winner. And um, his brother and his family were there for the award. Paul, had, unfortunately, we had to give it to Paul posthumously. He died just two months before oh. the award. Um, but uh, their family spoke very lovingly of Paul, but also very clearly about the challenges of families with, in, with children. But what a quality of life oh. you left for this man. Yeah. Yes, right? absolutely. I mean, Paul actually went on to become a world-class swimmer and in the Special Olympics won a gold medal in the World oh, Special Olympics. And, awesome. and his family was, they were always so proud of him. And, but uh, getting back to the history a little bit more, because I know we're going to be leading into John. In the 1990s, sheltered workshops started becoming passe. And it, mm -hmm. was, uh, uh, it really wasn't natural to think of uh, the company where I work, all my coworkers have intellectual disabilities. They have issues that they have to deal with. I mean, uh, so there was a movement called supported employment that came along, which we embraced completely, right. which was to get, if people could work in normal work environments, work in the private sector, as opposed to working in a sheltered workshop, how much would their lives be improved exactly. because of uh, real life interaction? Real life interaction. <laughs> yeah. Real life people in real life who are role modeling and how you know life really is on a day to day basis and mm -hmm. giving the folks. I mean, the one thing I know is the thing that the folks in our programs want are what you have and what I have. Mm -hmm. You know, they want access to the community, uh, use any community resource. They want to have relationships with right. individuals in their lives. Uh, and in group settings and very restricted, even though they're in the community, mm. those settings can still be very restricting and not allow people to access the very things that we but it do. But it doesn't allow individuals to grow either. No, it doesn't. When you, when you limit what they have access to, their experiences determine their outcome. Of course. So the more experiences they can have real life experiences, real time, yes. is going to produce a more productive member of society. Who's able to contribute their unique talents and mm -hmm. skills to that community. And I believe, and, and the mission of AEI, and we all believe at AEI that a community is richer when every single member of that community right. can contribute the skills and talents they have to that community. And so that's what we're about now. We're trying to break down those barriers as much as we possibly can. Uh, look, all of us need help. Uh, right. uh, you know, I, I, my wife will not let me use power tools. <laughs> destroy the house. You know, so I need I help. Love power I tools, to, well, Jerry. I'm going to have to call you up and have you come over. I don't know that. about that. I, didn't, I don't know if I'm safe but, with them, but I do love well, them. I have to. I have to hire a carpenter because I'm not skilled there. Yeah. yeah. Well, our folks, they're they don't have skills in certain areas. Exactly. But we all need support. We all support each other. And, that's right. And that's. Uh, how these folks live a more fulfilling life. That's fantastic. We're going to take a break right now, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be back with um, John Raposa, and this is The Q. My name is Carrie Quintel, host of The Q, a show dedicated to hope, inspiration, and giving back to the community. Please tune in live Monday evenings at 7 p.m. You can also watch us on a V stream at 4DSportsTalk.com. We have shows dedicated to hunger, 
yoga adventures, homeopathy, pain relief, and much, much more. We hope to see you Mondays at 7 p.m. Thank you. One. Welcome back to the queue. Tonight in the studio, we have John Raposa, also known as Comic, right? No, um, never. No. Never. Um, and, and John is the Supported Employment Supervisor. And John, tell us a little bit about how you got into this line of work. Well, I'll tell you, it, it really, when I think back on it, was kind of an accident. Um, There's you know, no I accidents. Could, yeah, no, I guess <laughs> not. But, um, well, you know, I, I started out just like everyone else does, and, and I guess I, that's something that I want to talk about uh, later involved in some of the work that I do now. But, uh, you know, I was lost. I had no idea really what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I know I loved working with people. Uh, and, you know, I took a job. This is kind of crazy when I think back. I took a job. My uncle had, um, he owned a bunch of buses. And they took a part-time job being a monitor on one of his buses. And the buses um, that he put me on had individuals who um, had intellectual disabilities. Uh, and quite honestly... See, you was, weren't lost. Well, I, I, you know, <laughs> it was kind of just like, okay, there's a job. I'm, I'm going to take it. Uh, right, right, right. Um, and it was, a, it was a short job. I mean, it was, a, you know, it was during one school, um, you know, uh, one uh, one school season, whatever, and uh, um, I, I was intrigued and I, I, I enjoyed it. I, I always knew that I wanted to help people, but mm -hmm. I didn't know how I was going to do that. So I started by helping people get their meals by waiting tables, um, and that. And quite honestly, I I saw an ad in the paper for Attleboro Enterprises, and this is 21 years ago. So you've been with them for 21. I've been with Attleboro years. Enterprises for 21 years. Wow. Um, and I, you know, I, I interviewed for the job. I was fairly green, um, and uh, it's been a great ride ever since. So, uh, what what exactly is a supported employment supervisor? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, like I said, I've worn a lot of hats. I did start out in um, in direct care, so I was working in uh, the group homes that Jerry uh, was talking about before. Mm -hmm. So I was providing direct care to individuals who have developmental disabilities and were, were living in. The so homes. you were doing the hands-on care. I was doing the hands-on care. Yep, absolutely, and I did that for quite a while, um, and then a position. Uh, opened up at uh, at the central office, which is North Attleboro is kind of our nucleus, as Jerry said. You know, we have um, group homes in Fall River, yeah. and you know, so I was working down in Westport actually. Um, interestingly enough, the first person that I had to work with um, was living at the um, was living at Dever, um, which was a um, institution, uh, and he was a deaf blind individual. Uh, that I started working with, and uh, that was baptism by fire uh, for me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and and that was that was the overcrowding that Jerry was talking about as well. Yeah. So the yeah, stuff that yeah. so they this said, was at the time where we were getting people out mm -hmm. and, and moving them into uh, wow. um, into homes. Um, so uh, so I, I applied for a position in the in the in the facility based workshop, actually the sheltered workshop. Mm -hmm. Um, and I started doing that. Um, I started doing the, some of the direct care work there, um, which was, uh, you know, assisting individuals with the piece work, uh, counting work, and, you know, helping people get through their day. Um, so you've been um, in the whole movement here. Well, yeah. And Just then, about. actually, um, I, uh, I ended up being a supervisor for a while for our residential program. Um, which was kind of neat because I had been there. I understood where mm -hmm. the individuals, you know, the staff were coming from. So I did that. And um, and then probably the best thing that ever happened to me is um, <clears throat> Jerry asked me to um, look at our Massachusetts rehabilitation program. At the time, it was a very small program. Um, but, uh, uh, and that's what I've really been doing ever since. I, I think solidly for the last 10 years, um, it's been my work with, uh, with Mass Rehab. And, and what is Mass Rehab for? Well, for, to put it in a nutshell, yeah, Carrie, the, the easy version, the easy version yes. is, um, you, you more or less have, um, two 
types, if you will, of individuals that have challenges. I mean, mm -hmm. we all have challenges. I could be here all night talking about my challenges. Right. Jerry just told us about have... the power tool challenge. Oh, well, yeah. I have to say that Jerry, and Jerry's well aware that I'm, I'm, in, that, I'm in that group, too. <laughs> Um, my neighbors get very scared when they hear noises <laughs> coming from my house. But um, so you have individuals that have developmental disabilities, and they're they're supported by the Department of Developmental Services, mm -hmm. um, and um, they are they are eligible. Um, they're funded by the state to come to places like Alabar Enterprises and have a meaningful day and participate in volunteer work and, and Jerry mentioned the Dehabilitation Program. Well, there is a whole other population that when they come out of school, both, both types, both people um, eligible to stay in school until they're 22 in the state of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. But then where do they go? Well, people with developmental disabilities are supported by developmental services. Mm -hmm. And they're given the opportunity to, um, you know, possibly come to places like Adler Enterprises. The whole other percentage, the whole other, I mean, and you're talking running the gamut here, are people with attention deficit disorder, learning disabilities, manic depressive, schizoaffective, generalized anxiety. Um, I guarantee you, you know at least one person that has something that I, I just, do. that I just mentioned. I do. And when those individuals come out of school, um, they really don't have a whole lot of support. Right. But there is an entity that supports them called the Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission. And this is, a, this is an entity that is for helping people develop vocations and find jobs I mean they do some other things with schooling and everything else but for mm -hmm. the most part they are a straight up find a job keep a job right um, and and again so it's not done in this experimental setting it's done in the real work life setting this is these are right? yeah these are these are these are mm -hmm. individuals who their the disability may not be apparent that's right you know, you, you, can't may have, you, you can't see That's attention right. deficit disorder. You can't no. see that. That's correct. Um, I, it's funny because, you know, I, I too work with a lot of children uh, with developmental disabilities. And I like to call it the invisible disability because it's almost like it doesn't exist to the general population. Right. But it's very, very real, not only to the child or adult, but also to their families. Sure. Absolutely. And so I, I didn't mean to I didn't mean to cut you off, but I no, think it's no, really, no. I think that that's is, important to say. Um, so, it, to be eligible to work with with the Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission, you need a challenge, right? Um, and once you are working with Mass Rehab, um, I'm going to call it MRC from now on, so I don't okay. have to keep saying the Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission. Okay. Um, so, what happens is you have an individual. Who needs to work? I mean, I think that most young folks come out of school, they get jobs. Right. Getting hooked up with mass rehab allows the individual to get voc rehab counseling. Um, and they start from the ground up, you know, um, and mass rehab contracts with Attleboro Enterprises to help find these individuals jobs and that is my right now my primary function at Attleboro Enterprises so I may get a referral uh, from Mass Rehab of someone that has attention deficit disorder and a learning disability and I work with them I work with their families mm -hmm. and also very important I work with employers um, I right now I work with a, a bunch of employers on a on a corporate level, um, and it's getting the employer to buy into the mission, um, to be able to support these individuals while they're on the job. Because if you have attention deficit disorder, or and I'm not picking on the ADD folks. No, no, no. Um, I understand. You have a you have a challenge, and you know. You may not want everybody to know that you have a challenge. So you apply for a job, you get a job, and now you say you're working at Target. Well, you interview just fine. You're right. But now your employer wants you to do A, B, C, and D. Right. And you can only do A, B, and C. 
and D and E are kind of falls by the way. Now your employer's like, what's wrong with this? What, right. What's wrong with this young man? What's wrong with this young woman? And everyone knows how competitive it is out there mm -hmm. right now. So your entry level jobs, you're expendable. You go, you know, you exactly. move along. What Mass Rehab does is refers the person to me. Now you tell me you want to get a job at X. Mm -hmm. After I've worked with you and I've assessed your abilities and, and we've talked about your goals, I go into an employer before they even see you. And boy, do you go into an employer. Well, yeah, I, 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 I do. I kind of have You're that You're persistent, John. Uh, yeah, I yeah. am pretty persistent. Okay, I can say um, that from personal experience. Go ahead. Yeah, I learned everything from you, yeah, though, that's right. for sure. Um, but anyway, I can talk to a human resources department about the specific individual and right. how they're going to learn and what may um, be some barriers. Um, so now the person comes on and now they're working and something goes wrong, well, I can go in there and I can talk so to the... So you're support. Can, exactly. And I'm support however the individual needs me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I take a lot of calls. I take a lot of off-site calls. The person that's like, hey, John, I don't want to go to work tomorrow because I'm too anxious and I, I, I'm, right. I don't like it or I'm arguing, you know, I, I'm not getting along socially and everything else. It's my job to talk those individuals out of that stuff. Right, right. Or at least find a way that they're able to connect um, with their employer and with the, um, you know, with their, with their co-workers. And employers have a right, and you try to find a good match for employers and employees, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so, I mean, absolutely. you're not gonna, you're not going to put someone in a job that they absolutely can't even do A. No, absolutely not. And mm -hmm. that's why, see, I meet with the person first, I meet with the family um, and try to get, you know, because there are challenges and then there are, uh, you know, for my younger folks. And, and by the way, I don't, want to, I, I don't want people to think the mass rehab just works with young folks. Right. I work with anyone from 22 to 70. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to kind of make that clear too. But, um, you know, you, you, you have these uh, young folks, they don't know what they want to do. Right. But because I've gotten a good handle on the employers, um, and I don't know if I can say the employers that I, that I work with. Oh, see, why not? Um, well, I mean, on a, on a corporate level, I work with um, Stop and Shop. I work with Panera Bread. I work with Lowe's. I work with Target. Shout out Stop and Shop. And I mean, I mean all the employers. Uh, and, and what it's They're allowed... They're all part of the movement. They certainly yeah. are. And what it's allowed me <clears> to do, <throat> Carrie, is... Attleboro Enterprises now works with Taunton Attleboro. I work with Brockton. I work in the Fall River area. I work in New Bedford. And mm -hmm. it's because we've gotten these employers, these larger employers that have budgets to be able to hire individuals. Um, they buy into the mission. So let's get back to this because we're going to take a break very shortly. Sure. But So any employer that's looking that may want to speak to you about this, about supplementing their workforce, about helping individuals can reach you at 508. Straight up jobs, absolutely. They can reach me at 508-695-4046. My direct extension is 105. Okay. Um, uh, my cell phone. Yes, is, go is ahead. A, it's a work cell phone. <laughs> you can call at any time. Um, I'm usually not up this late, though. 508-409-8440. Uh, <laughs> All right, slower. 508-409-8440. Um, Perfect. We'll be right okay. back. My name is Carrie Quintel, host of The Q, a show dedicated to hope, inspiration, and giving back to the community. Please tune in live Monday evenings at 7 p.m. You can also watch us on a V stream at 4DSportsTalk.com. We have shows dedicated to hunger, yoga adventures, homeopathy, pain relief, and much, much more. We hope to see you Mondays at 7 p.m. Thank you.
One. Welcome back. We have Jerry Pilkington again. Thank you so much. Um, now, we left off talking a little bit about the services, but I, I didn't want to sort of let that go. Sure. So I, I thought maybe we would pick up there. Yeah. I, you know, Attleboro Enterprises, where we left off, um, I'd like to talk about where we are today and the kinds of things we're doing, because we're talking about how do we provide supports and services to people in a way that lets them fulfill their lives in their community settings right. with their fellow citizens, their family, neighbors, uh, and the like. So from sheltered workshops, we went to, in the 1990s, what we called supported work, mm -hmm. placing people as much as we possibly could with local employers. Uh, we did develop a what's called a dehabilitation program. We mentioned it briefly. Yes. A medical model program uh, offers physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, RNs to uh, follow people's medical care. So again, what we're doing here, though, is we're taking individuals from the home, from isolation, That's where correct. they're getting these services, into groups and incorporating that, the that, whole program. That's yes. Okay, okay. And, and then we got rid of the sheltered workshop. You know, it was, it was like, if people are going to work, they're going to work for minimum wage. Right. So uh, the piece rate, the sub-minimum wage is totally gone mm -hmm. with Attleboro Enterprises. Uh, we did, as an alternative for people who, we do have people because of age. Right. Or because of their own personal interests. Uh, were not interested in going out and finding employment. They were interested in being with their peers, so we run a variety of community activities. We do put them in volunteer situations where they're seen as valued members of, of the community. Yeah. They'll work at soup kitchens or mm -hmm. uh, Lenore's Kitchen. And I do want I do want to thank I have to I have to put this plug in for the Kids Summer Cafe. We had some of uh, we had some of your people. Yes. And they were just fantastic. And that was a, an example of their volunteer opportunities. So I want to thank you so much for sharing, you know, sharing them with us. Well, actually, uh, we need to thank you because, number one, you put the program together, which is so vital. And you were open to letting our folks be oh. there. And you gave them an opportunity to show what they're able to do. So we thank you for that. Oh, and on your you. behalf, I thank you. Oh, okay. Well, well again, it, it takes a whole village there. So it does. So it's me. the village yes. working together. Perfect yes. example. Um, so we have community-based day supports, people doing social activities, recreational activities, and the like. Um, we now offer uh, in-home supports for people. It's almost like family services, almost like a visiting nurse would for an elderly individual mm -hmm. who has uh, medical needs. Yep. Well, we have people who uh, either live at home or even maybe rent their own apartment. Mm -hmm. And they don't need a staff person there 24 hours a day. But maybe they don't drive. Right. Or maybe they, they need assistance in learning how to cook nutritious meals. Right. So we'll schedule staff on a, on a flexible basis in the, according to the needs of the individuals. Right. They set the schedule, uh, they tell us what they want, and we provide the staffing for that. Mm -hmm. We recently became what's called an agency of choice, which is very unique in that we allow, now allow the individuals to hire and fire the staff, the AEI staff, <laughs> who work for them, yes. who work for them. So we co-manage people now mm -hmm. together. Um, so, you know, so an individual, if I... If, if I, I didn't like you, Jerry. Then you can let me go. <laughs> right. Or if I'm, not get, if I'm not providing you the supports that we agreed to, right. that I told you I was going to provide you, well, you can go to our director of administration, who's in charge of human resources, mm -hmm. and say, look, a person's not meeting my needs. Right. Person's gone. You go through the process of hiring someone again. Right. So, and... Um, and now we're even getting into, we're going to be submitting, uh, where uh, there are other organizations that do it, but what's called shared living, where we're getting away from the group home model. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll be recruiting families or individuals, you know, uh, adults who maybe have an apartment or a condominium, and they'd like to share their life with someone. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and what we'll do is we'll work with those folks if they're willing to take in someone, one mm -hmm. of the people we support to live in their home, then we'll work with those families or that individual uh, to help support them. We'll provide respite when they need respite because they want to go on vacation or there's something right. that else and, and this they, person wouldn't be yeah. able to go. But uh, that's how we're trying to bring folks much closer to the community and living those lives, the very life that you and I have right. the great you know, pleasure of living. Right. But boy, what a change. Major what change. Major change. Major change from institutionalization, yes. I'll tell you that. Yes. yes. Yeah. But how exciting. Oh, it, it is. Must be, it must be awesome to be part of such a movement. It's, uh, you know I something, mean, I'm, I honestly consider myself one of the luckiest people I know because uh, I go to work every day and it's great. I, I mean, seriously, living or right. working with people, the, the, the great joy of working well, number one, you, you get to feel like you're championing someone. You are. <laughs> uh, and they certainly appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also one of the great reasons to know the folks that we work with. It's very refreshing to work with people who have no filters. In yes. Way. No defense mechanisms, yes. if you will. They you tell the you. Story. You get the yes. real story. It's the most honest environment I've ever been involved in in my life, and it's very refreshing. Uh, I, I mean, there's just some fun, cute little story. Yes. Okay. Well, there was <laughs> a gentleman uh, in our program in North Attleboro, where my office is. His name is Tim. Mm -hmm. And he had to go to a dentist appointment. And when Tim came back, he came running into my office. He was all excited. And he said, uh, Jerry, were you ever a model? <laughs> and I'm going, a model? Tim, why do you ask that? He said, I'm looking through a magazine at the dentist's office, and I see a guy who looked just like you. And I'm thinking, oh, that's great. He goes, yeah, old guy, a lot of gray hair. <laughs> and that's no what you filter. get every day. So no it's, filter. It's, yeah. Exactly. But, but how refreshing. I mean, we live in such a difficult world. Yeah. We really do. We, we're surrounded by negativity. And so to, to be working in this field and seeing such amazing things in yeah. a relatively short period of time. I mean, short I know it's taken, a, it's taken a while, yeah. but it's really taking off at this point. Yeah, and it's really, and it's even, there are lots of great organizations out there that are really pushing the limits with this and uh, empowering people to take greater control over their lives. Mm -hmm. And we want to be part of that movement as well. Right, right. Uh, you know, I, I, it's, you know, like you say, I mean, I mean, look at the presidential election, not to go anywhere, but all the you negative, you can't negativity. Go there. Yeah, there's, it's, uh, it's you know, with the folks that, that, that we support in our programs, they could almost role model for us in some ways. Yeah. And some of the, some of the, in my lifetime, some of the strongest individuals I've ever met have been people in our programs and to see the achievements that they've Absolutely. achieved against the odds has been it's been an honor to be involved in that it, it, it it's really it's really quite moving um, so we talked about a little bit about the day services the, yep. the residential yep. we talked a little bit about the transitions yes. what about like donations or businesses getting involved well, uh, we are a nonprofit corporation. Yeah, any organization, yeah, it, any organization that would, or anybody in their, you know, if if, you know, in their estate planning, mm -hmm. if they would like to consider if this is a population that they would like to support, mm -hmm. obviously we would welcome that. Mm -hmm. uh, businesses that would like to contribute, yes, uh, we've been very fortunate. We've gotten great support from, again, I mentioned the Auger Corporation, fantastic. Balfour Corporation helped us out uh, when we, re back uh, in 2010, did a renovation. Do you also do the Day of Caring? Well, the day of sharing through the United Way? We don't. We're not don't involved. We are not involved with United. We're okay. not a United Way organization. Okay. I uh, wasn't sure so, about that. Yeah. Uh, the reason for the, well, there's, uh, 
if you think of the way our development, we always ran, when we were a sheltered workshop, mm -hmm. ran as a business. And back in the old days, we thought, we're going to show the world that we can make it as a business. Mm -hmm. with, because it, we thought it would reflect really well on the workers that right. we had. Right. That if they can make it, you know, with these, the, these employees, well, we could make it with those employees as well. That's right. what our thinking was. So uh, since we were trying to do that, we didn't participate with the United Way because, mm -hmm. uh, quite honestly, there are a lot of really needy organizations right. in the community, and the United Way really goes to bat for them. Right. And we were doing okay. We were keeping our head above water. So let me ask you this. I know this is going to be a bold question, but uh, I, I uh -oh. want to ask. I want to uh, ask. Do I have to answer? No, you don't. <laughs> you could take the fifth if you wanted. <laughs> okay. But where do you see Adapro Enterprises going in the next, say, five to ten years? In the next five to ten years, I think um, Attleboro Enterprises will become uh, an organization that has a, a much greater flexible temporary workforce. I think um, in, when you empower people to take control over the, the services they want to receive, in the, the hiring manner, and firing that you were talking about. In the about. manner that they want to receive it. Yep. I think you're going to need to have a very flexible workforce to meet those needs. And as you know, as we age, our needs change all That's the time. Right. Uh, the skills of that temporary workforce is going to have to change over time. But then at the same time, we're going to, have, we're going to be growing with uh, very... Uh, with autism. I mm -hmm. mean, autism is through the roof. Yeah, I know it is. Uh, we, we're seeing it. We're, um, we're involved in, with 10 local school systems from Swansea, Somerset, all the way up through Foxborough with special education uh, uh, departments mm -hmm. providing pre-vocational training for students before they leave school at 22, hopefully putting them in a position to get a job when they leave so they don't have to go mm -hmm. into the adult service system. Uh, but that presence in the schools, uh, we can see uh, autism has exploded. Uh, don't know why. Uh, there are different theories about right, it. Right, Some right, Some people right. think it's what we're doing to ourselves environmentally. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a major burden on school systems going to be a major burden on the adult uh, service system in the future. Right, right. Um, where, where would you like to see businesses step up the most? Where can businesses help the most? Is it money? Is it volunteer? Is it opportunity? Opportunity. It's opportunity. Opportunity. So the opportunity, it's, it's the opportunity that John was speaking John, of about. The, the opportunity John is talking about, be open to hiring individuals. We'd, we're not asking. And again, the, the, let's be clear about that. The business can hire or fire them too. Of course. Because if it doesn't work. Of course. They have a resource. Uh, yes. They have John to, to help out. And the fact of the matter is, we're not looking for bad hires. Right. Bad hires only hurt us in the future for right. the for the individual who's capable of holding a job. Mm -hmm. If there's a real bad experience with an employer, that's not what we're looking for. We just ask at least give them the interview. Mm -hmm. Meet the individual, give them an interview, see if there's a possible fit. Right. We also have I mentioned the 10 schools that we're involved in. Yes. We need internships for those students. And the fact that it, it, the thing is Oh, we, I didn't think of that. We pay the wages for those right. internships. So it's, it's free to an employer. What we're asking is an employer give a special education student who's in high school mm -hmm. who may be leaving. If they're 20 years old, they're going to be leaving school in two years. Mm -hmm. We want them to get a real work experience. So we want them to get that interview. And we want it to be a legitimate interview. Right. We want to see how that individual responds or reacts in the interview. Uh, we want them, if indeed they're taken on in an internship, we want an honest evaluation of their work performance 
from that employer. That's all we ask that for from so the employer. That is so critical. I think, I, I think at that point you, you, you completely have me on that, which is an honest evaluation. An honest evaluation. Because that student's still going to be in school for two years. We can take that evaluation, go back to the school system, and in that student's individual education plan, if the right. employer says they have to improve their math skills, right? they have to improve their reading skills, right? they have to improve their social skills, well, that's what you can start concentrating on in school before they leave at age 22 and enter the, if they don't have those skills, they're not going to get hired, they're going to enter the adult service system, right. and they're going to be a drag on the taxpayer, quite honestly. Right, right. And so we want success stories. Of course we do. That's exactly it. Yeah. Jerry, I, I can't thank you enough. I mean, your, your passion comes out in, in, in the way you speak of the program, in the individuals that you work with, the stories that you've shared with us today. Um, I really would encourage any employers listening to reach out to Attleboro Enterprises yourself or John um, and, and, and just see what it's all about because I know even myself, I have worked with Mass Rehab and it was a very rewarding experience. Yeah. Um, and so I, I would I, I would encourage anyone who might be hesitant um, to know that the support of Attleboro Enterprises will make it a success. Well, so I thank, thank you for that. I appreciate so, it. And you've done it in uh, you've. It's not just word. You've done it in deed, and we really appreciate well, that from you. Well, you guys are doing a fan. Everybody there is doing a fantastic job, and we're going to take a break, and we will be right back. Great. Thanks, Gary. Good evening, my name is Carrie Quintel, host of The Q, a show dedicated to hope, inspiration, and giving back to the community. Please tune in live Monday evenings at 7 p.m. You can also watch us on a V-stream at 4DSportsTalk.com. We have to hunger, yoga adventures, homeopathy, pain relief, and much, much more. We hope to see you Mondays at 7 p.m. Thank you. One. Welcome back. We're back with John Raposa. It's been really fun doing this. Ah, uh, this is a blast. Learning. This is actually a blast. But I love it. But it's so educational, and it's 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 um, I, I love it. I, I really do because I think that the work that you all do about giving back to the community is what this show is dedicated to. So thank you so much again. Uh, but I wanted to get back to sort of mass rehab and the job component of it, and just kind of. Nail that in if we could. Sure, sure. I, you know, when you asked, you know, what are we looking for for employees? And I think Jerry said, you know, that would be my answer too, um, is opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, everyone knows how competitive it is out there. Right. Um, so if you see my face or you hear my voice on the phone and I'm asking, you know, for you to give some shot, um, it's really just the, the first step is going through that stack of applications and pulling out my young man or young woman and saying, hey, you know what, let's hear this out. Um, because most of the time I accompany them on the interview. So, um, you know, so it's, it's really just about opportunity. And the other thing that I, I, I wanted to talk about, I have to get this, this message out there. Um, Jerry talked a lot about um, our transition program and, and working with students who are coming out of school. Mm -hmm. The 22. Um, the 22-year-old, yeah. okay? And, you know, parents, uh, you know, we all love our kids, and we all want what's best for our kids. Uh, and when it comes to choosing jobs, I just want people to think about job development. Job development is not just finding someone a job. Um, job development is a process, especially for our folks that have challenges. Um, you know, there are social issues. There are, there are all sorts of things that go on. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times with the school systems and parents, they kind of get caught up with 
what sort of job it is. Is it a high profile job? Um, is it my dream job? Maybe not well, yet. No, but and and what I you, you know what I say all the time, and I speak to to um, uh, you know on trans nights. I you know I talk to parents, and I hear a lot of parents say, "Where is my son or daughter going to go from a job at Lowe's or Target or Home Depot or Panera Bread mm -hmm. or Toys R Us or mm -hmm. wherever?" And that can be very detrimental because everyone needs to start somewhere. somewhere. Yeah. And I always say, what was your first job? Like, I'm sure you, you didn't come out of the womb as a lawyer. No, I so, But what not. was your first job? What Let me ask you. Job? What was your first job ever, ever, ever? I think my first was a waitress. Okay, so your first job was a waitress. Now, let me ask you. If I was... <laughs> when you got that job as a waitress, did you sit down with your entire family <laughs> and an IEP team and everything and say, well, you know, I think that Carrie would, you know, be able to grow from a job as a waitress. No. Right. You, you, the job was there and you took the job. My first job, my oh, cry, you know, my God, I was no, working... No, I take a, that back. It was probably babysitting. All right, Before babysitting. Can, yeah, okay, babysitting. Yep. Babysitting's a good one, too. Um, but I like the waitress better. Okay, well, I do. Well, because I like the waitress better because, you know, you babysit for your neighbors or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, now you've got a job, okay? And what did you learn on that job? Well, I can tell you without you telling me what you learned on that job. You needed to work with a boss. You needed to do what your boss said. You needed to learn how to interact and be a team player with your coworkers. Right. You knew that if you didn't do your job, you were most likely, you know, unless you had a really easy boss, that you were expendable um, and that you were replaceable and that uh, re replaceable. Um, and if you needed to call out sick, you need to do that in 24 hours. I mean, there are so many steps to the first job. Right. Why would we skip that step with a typical individual? Uh, you wouldn't want to do that for a typical individual. Right. So why would you want to do that for someone with a challenge? So I, 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 I urge parents out there that when you're, you're talking about job development, that other jobs will come. Right. But it's so important to get the basic skills of a job. Foundation. Eh, absolutely. Yeah. Foundation is the word. Um, and a, in, in a lot of instances, um, I, I understand that, that parents um, sometimes are, are very nervous. Transition is a very scary time for everyone. Absolutely. Um, you know, and it's and it's very scary for the individual. Uh, and I just that starting at a, a you know a particular job, um, you know, and I, and I mean there are individual. I, I I can work with someone who just came out of school or someone that has their master's degree. So you know, it, it's all relative. Mm -hmm. um, but I just don't like. You know, I, I talk to my young folks. I say, don't get caught up on the on the stat, the label, the label the of the job, job right? Um, because you can get a lot from you know, mm -hmm. you can learn a lot from that first job. And what's better than having the chance? You know, when you're in an entry level job, if you fall, you pick yourself back that's up, right. and there's not really a you know. Um, that's kind of I I just had to get that out there because I think I'm, that raises important. an important point. Um, what I really want to hear about is I want to hear about your real life stories that you do, because I know you have a boat. Oh my God! I have. Uh, you know, I do have to say, and I, I was listening to Jerry saying that. Uh, um, you know, this is a this is a great job. And why? Um, and I, why I'll, from I'll, your? I mean, from my perspective. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you know. My employers see one side of it. They mm -hmm. see someone who has, you know, that's, that's working and, um, you know, they're providing supports and, and, and everything else. Um, my parents um, or, or siblings or, or, or friends of, of the individual, they get to see the other side. They get to see how the self-doubt has gone away now. And there's nothing like a job. I don't care psychiatrists and psychologists you're all that's all great and it's all part of the process but there's nothing like having a job I think right. everyone would agree with that so they get to see that side of it um, I get to see the thing right 
and that is what pumps me up. I mean, I've, I've worked with individuals who, um, you know, have come into my office uh, uh, with, with riddled with self-doubt and I'm not going to be able to do this and I'm not going to be able to do that and, you know, they're worried about their challenge and how is it going to affect me at work. And there's better than five years down the line. I bet. When I get a parent that says, you know that job at, you know, wherever? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, Joe just moved out of his house, or Sally just moved out, um, and she has a peer group, and he has a peer group, and he's, um, you know, uh, it's, it's opened it up, and it's, it's fantastic. Um, independence. Uh, independence. It's, a, a, it's a job growing. will give you, will, will give you so much, mm -hmm. um, and being able to see both sides of it is just, I mean, I absolutely, you know, I love my, I, I, I love my job, and I, I know you want to hear a story, and I've got story. like, a, I, I've got like a million know, stories, one. <laughs> but I, I'll tell you the, I, I'll tell you a story, um, and by the way, that, by the way, for everybody who's listening here, I know you tell great stories, because I was at your business after hours, and I know that you like it to come from the family, so John's a little... Well, shy I, I, here I, I, because oh he yeah, I'm very, come, very shy. Yes. I'm very shy. I'm very nervous <laughs> because he likes um, it to come from the families <laughs> directly, because it has more impact. But well, we don't that, have that's the why. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a story that that impacted me. Okay, and and we got to go back quite a few years. Um, when I first started working with, um, with mass rehab and I, I really didn't have a ton of experience. Um, and now I have, you know, I'm working with this mass rehab contract and, and at the time, maybe, um, in a fiscal year, I worked with maybe 12 individuals. Um, now I'm touching individuals, uh, a fiscal year. Um, maybe I placed, you know, um, 10 people, mm -hmm. um, out of those, um, over the past six years, AEI and, and myself and with uh, uh, we're all a team. Right. Uh, we've put over 130 people to work through wow. the Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission. So I can a uh, little plug there, but it's it's great. Yeah. So when I first started, I'll never forget this. Uh, you know, I, I I had done everything else, and I'm getting into this job development thing, and I'm starting to reach out to employers, and I had this one particular woman who. Um, was calling me on a basis, uh, you know, and, and I just didn't have the time. I didn't have the, the time in the contract. I just didn't have the time. I didn't know how to manage my time. Uh, Jerry will tell you sometimes I still don't know how to manage my time, but he's great with that. Um, but I had this person well, good, who was ver tell me this voracious, story. voracious, <laughs> voracious, <laughs> called and she called and she called. And finally, I good just said, her. you know, um, you know, just come in, come in on Friday, come in at lunchtime. Um, and she was telling me on the phone, she's like, I, I just really want, I, I need to meet with you. I, I'd like to go back to school. Um, uh, I, I, I remember at the time she said, you know, I have a job, but I, I need a job to supplement my income. And I said, okay, just come in. And, and um, when she came in, you know, she came into my office and I, I mean, she was a striking young woman at the time. She was probably, God, 20 years old beautiful young woman um, but she had lost her she had lost her arm in in a in a car accident mm. um, and it was tragic she had she was telling me the story and you know she was in the car with some of her friends and it it, it wasn't like a crazy accident it was a freak accident a truck backed in and you know her the other friends got out of the car um, and she was trapped so mm. they had to remove her arm to to get out of my office and she sits down and she, you know, I get my, my assessment tool out and I'm, I'm getting ready to ask her some questions. And she says, you know what, John, before you write anything down, I want to be sure that you are going to come on what I can do and not what I can't do. Oh, it's awesome. Now, but here's me. I'm thinking as soon as she came in, I was thinking... Well, she probably can't cash register. She probably can't work a cash register. She probably can't do this. She probably can't do that. I was thinking clearly that of the things that, that would be impediments to, to, to her being successful. Mm -hmm. And when she ever said that to me, it really changed my whole idea of, of job development. Because if, if I'm in the business, if you will, 
I'm working with people with challenges all the time. This thing that came to my mind was what she can't do. That's right. What do I expect these employers to think? That's right. So she wanted a job. Um, I have to be careful because I don't want anyone no, to no, know no, what no, I'm no, talking no, no, about. No, no, but right. she wanted a job. Yeah, we we, we found like her a job. All right, we found her a job. And um, she was able to go back to school. And she called me years later to thank me for finding her a job oh. as a cashier, by the way. Um, the where she thing. bagged her own stuff. She wouldn't use a prosthetic arm because she said that's just for show. Um, and the company that she was working for allowed, she said, you know, John, thank you so much. I got to see the inside of um, Fenway Park because oh. she was doing marketing out there for them. And that's, uh, um, that's that story. That's, that's an it. amazing that's story. Good. I well, mean, I, I and there's a, millions of them. I have a quote that I would like to leave us with this evening. Oh. And, um, it's by a Stephen Hawking, and it, I, I found it today, and I just thought it was so fitting. And it says, my advice to other disabled people would be, concentrate on the things your disability doesn't prevent you from doing well, and don't regret the things it interferes with. Don't be disabled as well as physically. Uh, that's. I, I I just that says it. I I, I think that's that more that or less sums it. it up right that there. That does sum it yep. up. So I want to thank you so much, both okay, you and thank Jerry, you so much. for joining yep. us. And um, this is this is the cue, and this show is about hope, inspiration, and giving back. So thank you.